This is the Create Your Own Life Show, where we interview people that are world-class performers, from Super Bowl champions to New York Times bestsellers to billionaires. We figure out what makes them tick and unpack it for you to do the same. I'm Jeremy Ryan Slate, and every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, we help you to create your own life. Hey, what is up, everybody? Jeremy here. It is Thursday. It is the 5th of May, 2022, and this is your Create Your Own Life show. Happy Cinco de Mayo, everyone. Hope you guys are having a great day and a great start to the week. And um, speaking of uh, Mexican Independence Day, we actually just booked our trip to Mexico uh, as I'm going to be speaking at Tony Watley's advance event, which I'm very, very excited for um, in... uh, uh, right near Cancun, I, I believe is where we're staying. So we just booked. We're going to be staying there the 17th through the 25th. The event is, um, I believe, the 19th through the 21st. But we're going to spend a little bit extra time. So I'm excited for that one. Uh, we just, you know, it's nice going to be able to get out of the country for a little bit for the first time in a while. And uh, and yeah, so we're we're definitely excited for that. If you guys have not checked that out, um, you're, we'll, we'll leave a link to that in the show notes so you guys can check it out. But uh, excited to finally be hitting some stages again um, in 2022. And we have a great episode in store for you today. We have Mark Moiser with us today. And uh, we're going to be chatting um, about quite a few things. But Mark's a really cool guy. He's actually running for Senate in California. And uh, he sued Gavin Newsom uh, a number of times uh, for COVID mandates. And um, we really kind of dove deep into civil liberties, what that means, and, and what we've kind of given up. Um, in this world we're kind of currently sitting in. And I, I kind of bring up the the whole idea of Antifa and mob mentality. And he brought back some really interesting stories from way back in our country's founding around the Federalist Papers and how it was kind of handled at that time. And he brings that back to kind of how resilient the Republic is. So I think this is a very interesting conversation as there's a lot of different threads to pull on um, and this goes really well with an episode we coming, have coming out next Tuesday uh, with Dave Rubin from Rubin Report. So, uh, you know, definitely excited to, to chat with Mark today, and I think you guys are going to enjoy this one. Before we jump into this episode, though, I just want to quickly remind you, um, my new book, Unremarkable to Extraordinary, is coming out on uh, the 21st of June, and it covers a lot of the incredible things that, you know, you and I have had a chance to learn from our guests and really distills it down and some actions that every single person can take. So you can get that over at getextraordinarybook.com. That's getextraordinarybook.com. And uh, if you get it over there and come back with your receipt, we're going to give you a free version of the audiobook, uh, which we're still in the process of recording. Definitely an undertaking to do. As well as our guide of 30 days to extraordinary. So that's getextraordinarybook.com. Um, also, uh, shout out to a couple great companies that made this episode possible. To our friends over at MyPillow, who right now are offering up to 66% off of select products. If you use my promo code, which is C-Y-O-L over at MyPillow.com, up to 66% off of select products. Also, shout out to our friends over at Audible. Uh, Right now, I am just finishing up reading uh, Don't Burn This Country by next week's guest, Dave Rubin. You want to get that book or any other book for free, courtesy of Audible. Just head over to jeremyryanslate.com slash book. That is jeremyryanslate.com slash book. All right, everyone, without further ado, let's get into this conversation with Mark Moiser. Hey, what is up, everybody? Jeremy here. And guys, I'm very excited for the guests we have with us today. We have Mark Moiser with us today, who is running for Senate in California um, and man, somebody's got to turn the state around. And if anybody can do it, this guy can. So Mark, thank you so much for hanging out with me today. Thank you for having me on. So Mark, you've had a very successful law career. I, I have to know, like, you know, why run for Senate now? Why not just continue to, to do your law career? Well, the reason why, and let, let's talk about uh, the, this, uh, what I've done over the last two years, sure. I've been involved in over 30 COVID lawsuits. Mm-hmm. And in all these lawsuits, we are basically arguing that the government mandates are exceeding the Constitution. 
Yes. And so whether we're suing for the shutting down of churches, the shutting down of schools, kids wearing masks, uh, businesses being closed, beaches being closed, capitals being shut down, whatever the reason why we're suing, the argument that we're always making is that the government uh, has exceeded the Constitution and thus, you know, the courts are to throw it out. But the argument that I should be making in every single one of these cases is that the fact that we, you have unelected bureaucrats passing mandates that have full force of the law violates the constitutional right of a Republican form of government. Mm -hmm. Because our Constitution guarantees to us a Republican form of government. That Republican form of government is that the laws that bind us are passed by our duly elected representatives. That should be my number one argument. However, over 100 years ago, the Supreme Court basically said that that is a political issue, one which the courts will not touch. Mm -hmm. It's a non judicial issue. And so with this, I mean, we've known about mandates for the last 100 years. Sure. There's yeah, we, we've seen it with, you know, like the Spanish flu and all these different things. So like, it's not new. It's not new. But the rate of unprecedented, uh, you know, mandates that we saw over the last uh, last two years, it's just it really, you know, I don't know the best words to term, but it really burns the conscience. It's it just really, it far exceeded anything we we're doing. I mean, in the past, you know, you had an opportunity to be heard but now what you get is these just emergency orders that really have no basis in science or fact mm -hmm. it's just like we're going to you know it doesn't matter that it scientifically doesn't make any sense to shut down the floral shop you can buy flowers in the grocery store or we're going to shut down uh you know at the very beginning you shut down all the big box electronic stores but walmart and Sam's Club could uh, <laughs> could sell electronics because they also sold groceries. And you know the lack of science, lack of common sense, just no opportunity to be heard. Just uh, whatever the public bureaucrat said, all of a sudden became the law. That it was unprecedented, mm -hmm. and unfortunately, the courts, uh, you know, really kept their hands away. And we couldn't come in and argue, wait a second, let's just stop right here. These are mandates. They're being passed by unelected bureaucrats. This violates the Constitution. Just shut it all down. Mm -hmm. And since the courts won't do it, and you know, here in California, you know, Gavin Newsom is never going to stop it. You know, as the executive branch. Well, he's he's he too busy eating at the power. he's too busy eating at the French laundry, man. He doesn't care about us. Or vacationing <laughs> in Mexico or Costa Rica, you know. Yeah. He, you know, he he He's not giving up his uh, emergency powers. He loves these emergency powers uh, because it allows him to do whatever he wants. He doesn't have to be accountable to people. He just can do what he wants, when he wants, how he wants. Mm -hmm. And so the only branch of government that's left is the United States Senate and the United States uh, Congress. And since the Constitution, since the courts have said it's basically up to the, you know, the the Senate and the House to actually guarantee this Republican form of government, I felt like I had no choice but to uh, go take my fight for people's constitutional rights from the courthouse to the U.S. Capitol. It's interesting, too, because I think the thing that's made it really difficult as well, Mark, is like we, we've mentioned we've had mandates before in history. We've never had them like this. But at the same time, we also haven't had you know, kind of the new public square controlled as well, right? Like we haven't had that, you know, you can't bring up an opinion on Twitter and yeah, we want information from doctors, but only the right doctors and things like that. So it's become actually very hard for even for anybody to have a viewpoint or anything other than what they're told to have. Yeah. I mean, that that's been ground zero, the fight that we've been dealing with. And, you know, there's been a lot of censorship and a lot of, uh, you know, and I'm, I'm going to be very careful what I say here because- sure. These are private companies that, you know, the First Amendment does not necessarily apply to them. It, you know, as a business, you have the opportunity to select who your customers are and who are not. Mm -hmm. I don't necessarily recommend that because people can vote with their feet, as we're seeing with Disney right now. Yes. Uh, uh, and I, I remember a few years ago, you know, they, they did it with Target and, you know, the left does it. And, you know, when businesses decide to get involved in politics, 
there can be repercussions with their customers. Uh, and that's the whole thing about Truth Social right now is, you know, there was so much uh, censoring of these private companies that, you know, competition started to arise. Mm -hmm. Now, that being said, the problem becomes when governments start telling private companies what they're to do. And we saw that with COVID with, uh, you know, the, the Fauci emails where Fauci is telling so social media platforms what is approved and what's not approved. That is absolutely unconstitutional in my mind. And I believe when it gets up to finally gets through the courts, it's going to be found that that was a major First Amendment violation. We are involved in similar lawsuits regarding election misinformation. Mm -hmm. uh, in our, our firm, I'm not personally involved in this lawsuit, but our firm is involved in a lawsuit against Twitter over election misinformation, where they basically uh, deplatform people or you know removed posts where government officials told Twitter this is election misinformation, and then the social media platforms. This particular case is involving Twitter removed posts or removed uh, uh, people who had been longstanding members, you know, on those platforms. With, so I, I heard Tim Poole talk about this yesterday, actually. He was talking about, I think it was actually in, was it in the state of California, actually, that government representatives in California came to Twitter and said, hey, you know, this is a problem. These people got to go. Yes, that is, that is the lawsuit that we are involved in. So I guess, how do you handle overreach like that then? Because we're, we're talking about here, like, you know, people should have a, 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 a say in this. We have a Republican form of government, but now the government's going into business and saying, hey, you got to do this. Like, that's a problem. And that's where the lawsuits against them, uh, <laughs> against the government. And, you know, unfortunately, freedom's not free and courts mm -hmm. are not quick. Yes. And, uh, you know, bureaucracy working on emergency orders shut down, you know, society in 13 minutes, but, you know, it took us over a year to get, uh, to start unwinding this stuff. I mean, we brought our first lawsuit in the end of April or the middle of April, and we didn't see the first Supreme Court case on it until uh, November, right after Thanksgiving or right before Thanksgiving. And, you know, the Supreme Court cases kept coming all the way up until I think it was April. So mm -hmm. there was like, five, six, seven Supreme Court cases that came down the dockets over, you know, just shutting down churches, but churches were shut down in literally minutes, but it courts just took, and that was, that was rocket docket speed. I mean, we were just blowing, you know, hearing after hearing, after hearing, after hearing, and it, it took somewhere between seven and, you know, seven months and a year till that issue was fully litigated. Mm -hmm. Uh, these issues are not considered emergency. And so it's going to be three, five, seven years before we can get those cases all the way to the United States Supreme Court. And so unfortunately, as I say, freedom's not free. Courts are not quick. Um, sometimes the political solution is going to be much faster than the, uh, you know, than the, the, the legal solution. But we are going to be pushing those legal solutions. But, you know, people have to understand the consequences. Obviously, Elon Musk uh, saw that he didn't like what he saw, and he decided to do something about it. The meltdown that's going on uh, at Twitter right now is very entertaining. Yes. Uh, because, you know, these, they're not owners of the business. They're employees of the business who were actively involved in silencing speech that they didn't agree with, and now they are upset that somebody else is going to come around and with the mindset of we are going to have a company based upon the principles of this is a public square. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's just funny to see how they, how entitled they are to use somebody else's money to promote their own political viewpoint. Well, we, we even look at what happened with the New York post, right? Like, you know, the New York post, um, I, I don't know if you read it, but I just finished uh, Miranda Devine's book, uh, the laptop from hell. And uh, if you if you look at a lot of the information that that came out around that, they shut it down right away. And, yeah. you know, there was a large percentage of Biden voters said, hey, if I knew this, you know, I wouldn't have voted for him. Like to me, that's with that level of election interference, like 
how do we actually, you know, know who we're voting for, vote for the right people? Like, like, how do we actually handle that if, if it, it makes our election systems broken? If you notice behind me, there's a lot of books. Yes. A lot of old books. And um, I'm, a, I'm a student of history. Yeah, same here. And I'd like to t- take a time. I'm going to take us back in time to right after the founding of this country. Uh, and I'm going to tell a couple different stories, but right here is a book written by Henry Lee. We all know him as Henry Lighthorse, Harry Lee, mm-hmm. One, uh, next to George. Most popular officer of the Continental Army during the American Revolution. What people don't know about Henry Lighthorse Lee Uh, This particular book he wrote, uh, I think it was in 1812, right before uh, the Second War against Great Britain. Mm -hmm. But at that point in time, there was was the Whig, I mean, there was the Federalist Party and the the Republican Democrat Party. Now, Baltimore happened to be a very, you know, they they were very much pro-Federalist. And... Henry Lighthorse Harry Lee happened to be a very strong Republican Democrat. Now, the city of Baltimore basically was clamping down on anybody. No, I, okay, I'm going to take that back. Baltimore was a Republican Democrat controlled, mm-hmm. uh, and they were they were clamping down on anybody who was doing writing for the Federalists. And the number one Federalist editor newspaper was a guy who lived in Baltimore. So if you were a Federalist and you wanted your opinions heard, you would send it to this editor because if he put it in his paper, then every Federalist paper in the nation tended to copy from him because he was kind of the de facto leader of that. And Mm. Baltimore, the city of Baltimore started clamping down upon him. Now, they didn't just pass laws. They basically sent vigilantes to his door to just destroy his business. And Henry- It sounds like Antifa, if you don't mind me adding that, man. (laughs) uh, Very much so. And so uh, Henry Lighthorse Harry Lee was a part of the group of people who said, you know, I don't care what party you are supporting. This is wrong. This is not why I fought the American Revolution. And he ended up helping him move his press to another building. But a second vigilante group came, and Henry Lighthorse Harry Lee basically stood in the door with his swords, with his pistols, and he fought off the mob for several hours with a couple other people until the sheriff came, and the sheriff basically marched him over to the prison uh, and you know they, they basically surrendered themselves to the sheriff. The press ended up being destroyed. The building ended up being destroyed. And Henry Lighthorse Harry Lee was just basically beat to a pummel. Um, and he was he only lived about five years beyond that. He was still a fairly young man at this time. He ended up going off to, to Bermuda to try to recover. Uh, but you know he was a you know they just absolutely destroyed his body, destroyed his mind. He was one of the most brilliant authors that this nation had at that time. And even though he was a Democrat Republican, he stood up against the Democrat Republicans for the free speech rights of the uh, of this Federalist guy mm-hmm. because he understood this is not right. And so what I'm getting at here is what we are experiencing right now is not new. John Adams shut down his opposition with the the Alien and Sedition Act, Mm -hmm. and Democrat Republican editors were thrown into jail over that. And the people said, you know what, enough is enough. And basically, uh, Thomas Jefferson and his brand of politics were swept into this nation, and they basically held control for the next 50 years of the nation's history because, you know, John Adams and the Federalist Party decided to say, you know what, you don't have, uh, you can't dissent against the government. Um, So it's not unprecedented what we are seeing. 
People think it's unprecedented, but it, you know, it's actually was much worse in the, I'll say seven all the way through the second war uh, with Great Britain, you know, the war of 1812. The, the, this was a very real reality. And you understand that these are politicians mm -hmm. who knew somebody. Yeah. Find that the, the First Amendment, who knew why the First Amendment was there, because you know King George was trying to silence uh, people's uh, speech and s silence dissenting opinion, and so it, there's nothing new under the sun. Uh, and what we have to understand is that the First Amendment gives the media the ability to print what the media wants to print, okay? Mm -hmm. And it is the duty of Americans to understand the bias of who the media is. Right, right. If, you know, if you're watching Fox, you're getting a little bit more right. If you're watching CNN, you're getting a little bit more crazy and too much Brian Stelter, but you know, like it's, you're, you're getting an opinion with it. Yeah, and that's what, you know, when, when you read the Federalist Papers, those were sent strategically to the editor that they were sent to mm -hmm. because they, yes, it was in New York. You try to get the New York to go a certain way, but that particular editor, his works were copied widely across the nation. Mm -hmm. And, you know, during the mid 1800s, you know, how did Abraham Lincoln campaign? Somebody would send him a letter and say, hey, these are my questions. Abraham Lincoln would not reply to that person. Instead, he would reply to the Republican newspaper in the county that that person lived in and says, you know, Farmer John just uh, sent this question. I figured if Farmer John was asking this question, everybody else would have it. And the Republican paper, which was really controlled by the Republican Central Committee in that county, would, of course, that would be the front page of their paper is that a letter to Farmer John from Abraham Lincoln, the Republican candidate for president. And, you know, we've always understood that media is biased. And, you know, and it's up to the, the listener or the reader to understand what the biases were. And that is why it, they made it so easy, you know, where you had the name of the newspaper that said Democrat or Republican or Independent or Union. Union <laughs> meant that it was the Union Pacific that owned it. So it, all these papers out there that you see the word Union on it, that is because it was owned by the Union Pacific Railroad, and you knew that you were going to get the company's long line. Uh, but that that you know newspapers were would broadly broadcast what the bias of the editor was and so the the issue is not okay twitter silenced this story well everybody should understand you know i knew that that story existed you knew that that story existed mm -hmm. why because we make sure that we have a broader set of platforms in which we get our information mm -hmm. and so uh the question is not do i have a concern about how twitter silenced these certain stories and certain people didn't get that message out no that is that actually felt falls back on the parties you, you can't go blaming twitter which was a private company mm -hmm. for exercising their editorial rights I don't think that was the First Amendment violation. You know, now when the federal government was getting involved, that's when it becomes a First Amendment violation. Mm -hmm. It would have been up to uh, Donald Trump as president of the United States, who this was his opposition. He knew the story. He had billions of dollars uh, that people were contributing. He should have bought an ad and put it in, you know, CNN. MSNBC, mm -hmm. CBS, he could have got that story out, you know, and well, th that's the, that's you know, the, the that, question that, I have. That, that's the question I have, Mark. Like, do you think Republicans play too nice? Like, I, I think that that often is uh, when you, when you look at it, because, you know, the, the, the left is aggressive and they make no apologies on, it. I think a lot of times it seems like the right kind of plays too nice. 
that is uh that that could happen you you could say that um yeah. you know it it's always easy to put yourself you know second guess somebody else in the decisions that they are making sure uh you know you know some some people would say that we're too too nice but you know other people would you know you, if you go too far you know you're you're accused of you know attacking a fellow republican or you're right. you know you're, you're you're slinging mud um you got to understand that politics is you know it's not a you know it's a fight mm -hmm. fight for our nation yes um and you know you know thomas jefferson the barbary wars you know the first two presidents before him washington and adams they were just taking up the one sixth of the united states budget to just buy the freedom of american sailors who were being enslaved in by the barbary pirates mm -hmm. but thomas jefferson said wait time out here time out here why are we spending our money to buy our american rights you know yeah, England can buy their rights, French can buy their rights, but we're the American experiment. We're different. Our constitutional rights are special. And if we're going, if all we're doing is buying our rights like everybody else, then we're going down the path of everybody else. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we got to stop this. And it's like our fundamental constitutional rights are too precious just to be bought with silver and gold. I'm going to take that money. I'm going to give it to the Navy. We're going to build the biggest Navy and we're going to go to the the coast of Africa, and we're going to take it to them. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we got to understand that for the left, politics is their religion. That's very true. That's extremely true. So they are going to give to politicians their tithe, basically. Mm -hmm. Now, they're not going to call it their tithe, but they give to politics like a Christian is going to give to their church, their parish, their uh, synagogue, okay? They are going to give their time, their energy to it like it's their religion. Mm -hmm. And their religion is this progressive, Marxist, communist, socialist uh, agenda, which means you can't just beat them today and wash your hands and say we're done because they're coming back tomorrow. Yes. This is like the hundred year war. It's the war that never ends. It's not like you can win and walk away. You know, if you read uh, anything about, you know, George Washington and the Revolutionary War, his biggest problem was not that he was fighting on home soil and he had an easy, he could easily, uh, recruit new people. His problem was that he constantly had to recruit new people hmm. because the commitment level was, you know, three months, four months, maybe a year. The, the American, you know, in America, we get in the drive through line at McDonald's and tell them to hurry up. <laughs> yeah. Okay. We are very impatient people. And this is not just today. I mean, as I'm saying, George Washington had this problem. Mm -hmm. FDR had this problem during World War II. Wilson had this problem during World War I. Abraham Lincoln had this problem during the Civil War. I mean, he was about to be run out of office after the end of his first term because the war was taking so long. And if Sherman hadn't done his march to Atlanta, or, you know, hadn't taken Atlanta, mm -hmm. he never would have, uh, he never would have been become president. I mean, what happened in Shiloh saved the elections two years before. Mm -hmm. The, you know, there, it's very, uh, the American people are very impatient people. But well, and that's, that's the major difference if you look at like the, you know, the US versus like a country like China, right? They're, yeah. they're thinking in hundreds of years or thousands of years when they're, when they're going towards something, we're like six weeks, maybe like we can't, we can't think with that. It's, it's a very different viewpoint. Yeah. And, and understand the lie that the left used to shut us down. You know, it was two weeks to flatten the curve. Mm -hmm. Now, if you think that they actually believed it was going to be two weeks, let me remind you what happened in the two weeks before that. 
we had a Democrat contested election pr primary system going on with a dozen candidates. Now, if you remember four years before, Hillary Clinton versus Bernie Sanders, Hillary Clinton won and Bernie Sanders was taking it all the way to the convention, all the way. He was not going to give up to Hillary Clinton. He was in this race. But all of a sudden, in 10 days, every single one of those Democrat candidates got out of the race and endorsed Joe Biden. And then magically, COVID enabled them to shut down the nation for two weeks. Mm -hmm. Okay, This whole thing was planned. They had complete control over their entire field of a you know highly contentious uh democrat primary they were able to shut down that whole thing in order to focus all their energies upon these mandates yep. that were just absolutely destroying everybody's right of self-governance destroying private property rights destroying public health destroying uh you know business rights i mean they just you know destroying your first amendment rights th this was an absolute opportunity for them to destroy our constitution and they are so committed to this religion mm -hmm. that bernie sanders got out of the race and endorsed joe biden you got to understand you know if you well that, that's well that's just that's my major concern then mark like that's that's what i'm worried about going towards of november of this year right you look at it like, OK, well, they, they like people aren't paying attention to the nuances. Right. Um, I think it was last week, Jen Psaki, when they were talking about the mask mandates on planes disappearing, she said, well, we're contesting it for the reason of preserving future power of the CDC. Well, what are they going to do in October, and November of this year? That's my concern, man. Yeah, well, and uh, we could sit here and spend the next uh, five years talking about what they're going to come up with next. I mean, the. <laughs> The, the, the one thing is stop saying uh, what will they think of next because they're taking that as a challenge. Yeah. Um, that's why we have to go back to the fundamentals and help people understand that the United States of America is the Constitution. Yes. It's set upon that we the people have a right of self-governance. And this self-governance is really what sets us apart from the rest of the nation. About a month ago, I was on a panel um, with the University of Connecticut and talking about COVID litigation, where we are, where we're going, and all that kind of stuff. And my two pa fellow panelists happened to be international lawyers. And they were bemoaning the fact that the United States could not act fast enough because of our constitution and that they, uh, you know, that we didn't have the same tools that they had in Europe. Europe and in Asia. And I just wanted to scream, yes. And that's why people are moving from Europe and Asia to the United States of America, because yep. our federal government is set up upon the foundation that we have the right of self-governance, that we the people are the government, and that we have given limited power to the politicians for the good of society to direct our life. We did not give the unelected bureaucrats this tyrannical control to say, you are essential, you are not, you can go to work, you must stay at home and do nothing. Uh, you know, we, this whole class, well, we're, you know, welfare of, oh, we're going to attack the rich and, you know, you can't go to the beach and, you know, just this absolute control over every aspect of our life. It's just really, I don't want to say it's unprecedented because you look at world history. This is what tyrants do. They get power, they get more power, they get more power, and they get more power. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, there is a reason why people come to America because the desire for freedom, the desire for self-governance is in each and every one of us. Mm -hmm. Tell a two-year-old to go take a nap. And they're going to exercise their right to self-governance. I'm, I'm laughing because that happened to me in the grocery store the other day. My three-year-old, uh, we had to exit the grocery store very quickly. 
But in the same way that you as a parent mm -hmm. have the ability to, you know, control that right of self-governance of your three-year-old. Mm -hmm. So we have given limited authority to our government, but that is our duly elected representatives are the ones who are supposed to pass the laws. Mm -hmm. And this giving of power to unelected bureaucrats who on, you know, today is Tuesday, so uh, you know, you can buy electronics at Best Buy, but yesterday being Monday, you can only buy them at Costco is totally unacceptable. Mm -hmm. And you know, it was against the science that we knew at that time. It was purely political what they were doing. And you know, all, many of these lawsuits, you know, Gavin did this, we sued. And two days later, oh, well, well got to, you know, modify, you know, what my orders were. And it's just, it, there was a joke in our law firm. What, what executive order do you want uh, Gavin to change today uh, or tomorrow? I will file a lawsuit today on it uh, because literally we'd file a lawsuit and Gavin would change the executive order, you know, in, we filed the lawsuit. I mean, there, there was so many examples of that where he was just trying to outplay the, the judges and keep the judges away from ruling on, uh, that what he was doing was unconstitutional by just, uh, I'm going to just change it enough. Okay, this, it was very, very political what was going on. They do not like the constitutions and the handcuffs it puts on them as politicians. And so the only way that we resolve the, these issues is that we educate the people. Mm -hmm. And that is up to the the people who are running for office, it's up to the political parties. You know, we have One American News Network. We have Newsmax. We have, uh, you know, we've been dominating social media. There's a yeah. reason why they're sciencing conservatives on social media. Yeah, I think, I know, think Dan Bongino has the rate. number one. Dan Bongino is the number one Facebook page, I think, daily. Yeah. Uh, you know, stop and uh, think about who the number one podcast is. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's not a Republican. It's not a Democrat. It's somebody who just tells it as he sees it. Mm -hmm. And you and I both knew who we we're talking about, right? Yeah, Joe Rogan. Yeah. And, you know, so the thing is, the legacy media, we may not control. Mm-hmm. But we're getting our opinions out on new media. We're getting yeah. our media, our, our, our opinions out on talk radio. We are getting, you know, and so yes, the, you know, the people who have this religious belief that they need to destroy the constitution, destroy dissenting thought in order to push their progressive agenda, mm -hmm. you know, this is war. Yeah. This is a fight for our freedom. It's not new. It's not unprecedented. And I mean, this is why we fought the war of independence. This is, you know, and it's not going to be won overnight. And it's never, the war is never going to be done. I mean, Marxism has been around for over 150 years. Yeah. You know, and it, that, philosophy worked its way into the communist revolution and Ronald Reagan defeated it with the cold war. Mm -hmm. So then it, it weaseled its way into education and everything else. And now it's trying to do it that way. Yeah. It's, it's pervasive, man. It is. Yeah. And, and you know what? We'll still be fighting this fight probably 150 years from now, 200 years from now, and it's going to look completely different than what it looks like today. Yeah, you know, you got to just understand that this is the left's religion, that they want to have complete control over everybody's life, and that's what's important to understand. Is that tyrants never are content with liberty? Yes, you know. Just like the Southern Democrat planters didn't want to work. They wanted to sit in their mansions and they and let other people harvest their 
often for them, harvest their tobacco for them. Uh, you know, they, you know, their life was going from party to party to party, you know, go there's no difference from that Southern Democrat plantation owner and the Democrat elite of today mm -hmm. who want to sit on their corporate boards, collect big paychecks, not provide anything of value to society, but dictate to others how they are to live their lives. There mm -hmm. is no difference from that Democrat uh, plantation owner in the South and these same Democrat uh, politicians today. You know, you see Maxine Waters' house, yet the district that she represents. You see Nancy Pelosi's uh, palatial house and the money that she makes, you know, on insider trading. Yeah, some, somebody's got to put the clamps you know, down on Paul. Like, seriously, it's getting a little ridiculous. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so, you know, we can go on and on and on about the double standards. I mean, who was it? Uh, Stacey Abrams was seen sitting in front of a group of kids all masked up and she's unmasked. We saw Gavin Newsom not wearing a mask and Eric Garcetti not wearing a mask at football games. You know, at the same time, kids are being, are being forced to wear a uh, mask. I mean, it's a complete hypocrisy of this ruling elite where, you know, yeah, you, you mentioned early on the French Laundry. Gavin Newsom was going, uh, eating out when everybody else had to stay home. And, you know, and they were all laughing, not wearing their mask. And, it you know, it was a very real example of a double standard. But that was the same double standard that you saw with the Democrat plantation owner that you see today. Hey, with Gavin Newsom, Joe Biden, Kamala Harris, uh, Nancy Pelosi, Maxine Waters. I mean, I could go on and on and on, and we could highlight this double standard that this ruling elite is living by. Mm -hmm. But, you know, we can go on and on and on, not just through United States history, but through world history. Yep. And this is what tyrants do. They get power, and they want to keep power, and there are very few instances in history. The Magna Carta is one of those things where the people said, time out, enough is enough. We in your power. Mm -hmm. The Declaration of Independence was one of those times. It was a key moment in history where the people said, time out, King George. We're not going to allow you to dictate to us who we can trade with, mm -hmm. when we can meet who we could speak We're not going to tell you to tell us who can own a gun and who can't own a gun. We're not going to tell you, you're not going to allow us, you allow you to tell us that we have to, at our own expense, house your army in our towns. Uh, and, and they said, you know what? Freedom is not free. Mm -hmm. And Thomas Paine came in and he wrote Common Sense. Now, at that time, he wrote it under a pseudonym. Nobody knew who Thomas Paine was until about the third edition. But he wrote Common Sense, and that sparked the hearts and the minds of the colonists. And what was a concept became a movement, which became a reality. Mm -hmm. the, the desire of freedom, the desire of self-governance is bigger than any tyrant out there. Yes. You probably watched the movie Braveheart. Yeah, great movie. Okay, and remember, those they had a little bit of power. They had a little bit of special privilege. And they weren't really willing to go take on the king of England. You know, why go attack this massive bureaucracy? I got my own little kingdom. Yeah, I don't have my freedom but i got some i'm, I'm better off than you people mm -hmm. and mel gibson came out there and he rallied the troops he rallied the people and he built a movement that eventually led to the social elite having to say well you know 
we're going to have to get involved here. Yep. And so what I am saying here and, and trying to get back to your point, probably very long winded, a lot longer. <laughs> than well, I what, think, I, th I think it comes back to Mark is, you know, like we've been able to live like we've been able to live because we have a Republic and the importance yeah. is, you know, like the left wants to make this a multicultural democracy. The right says, no, this is a Republic and Republic is what's going to treat people. Well, democracies eventually disintegrate into tyranny. It's what happens, you know, enough people vote for what they want and they get what they don't want. It's how it works. So we really have to concentrate on preserving the Republic and it's people like yourself out there fighting to make sure this happens and fighting long term, man, which is going to make it happen. So for people listening, they're hearing your message. And as goes California, goes a lot of the country. How can they support you? How can they connect with you? MarkMoyser.com, M-A-R-K-M-E-U-S-E-R.com. I am also on Twitter, which I happen to be verified just yesterday. Imagine that Elon Musk takes over and all of a sudden I become verified. I mean, I haven't been verified in 10 years. Yeah. All of a sudden, the very next day, I get verified. Go, go figure that one out. Uh, Facebook, I am also on True Social, and I am on Instagram. So on all four of those platforms, markmoisture.com, where you can uh, join my uh, newsletter, you can make a contribution, or you can sign up to volunteer. Very cool. Well, Mark Moiser, we need you out there fighting, man. Thank you so much for doing this today. Thanks for having me on. 